uh, seeing as today's the uh, anniversary of Adam Shah's uh, passing away, <clears throat> I might just um, talk a little bit about uh, Ajahn Chah and uh, um, particularly because uh, I didn't know him personally I might maybe talk a bit about my own experience in the forest monastery in uh, Thailand and because uh, that's obviously something which has been very formative for me very uh, uh, has definitively shaped my my uh, experience of Buddhism, my practice of Buddhism. In fact, I'd say there's really three three things which have have been my main influence in practicing Buddhism. One is uh, meditation practice, which is really the start where I first went to do a, an intensive vipassana retreat, and that was the beginning of my kind of spiritual exploration. The second thing is the study of the suttas, and then the third thing is um, uh, sort of the encounter with the, the, the living monastic community which was following the tradition of Ajahn Chah and uh, one of the <coughs> of course one of the reasons why uh, that was something that was very powerful for me was because it was uh, 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 an actual example of, of people who were really uh, doing their best to live as the Buddha wanted and as the Buddha said and uh, you know when when I started to to uh, uh, develop my, my meditation practice, you know when I first started, um, meditation that I was doing, I was doing a kind of a version of the Mahasi Burmese Vipassana system, and and that was that really opened up an incredible amount, you know, opened up this incredible window for me to 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 sort of start to look into the mind and start to realize that. Um, the, the nature of how you're aware and what you know can be changed and can be developed. And I, be, I, I actually could, through that uh, very intensive practice, experience something which uh, I was completely unaware of, I had no conception of, uh, and see the way that the mind is shaping perception, the way that, that the world that we live in, the world we inhabit, is built up out of our, our preconceptions, our ideas, and we don't even, we don't even question that. And so through that uh, retreat period, that, that I didn't, didn't have any expectations from that. Like I hadn't done Buddhist studies and practice and blah, blah, blah beforehand. I just re literally just sort of, you know, walked in there and then did the retreat. And uh, they, they did very little teaching at that time. So basically they would just tell you, this was at a monastery I went to in Chiang Mai, what Rangpeng. They would just tell you to sit down and meditate for such and such an amount of time and tell you how to meditate. And uh, when you told them about what you were what was happening, you just, they just kind of nod sagely and say, well, just note it. And that was it. Get on with life, go back and practice some more. So I did that. And I had experienced a lot of suffering and uh, a lot of joy. Uh, and at the end of that, I knew that this was what I'd been looking for. I hadn't realized that I'd been looking for anything, but that was it. I'd found it. Uh, so I wanted to keep on doing that. And I came out of the retreat. I asked them, because we couldn't read during the retreat, I asked them, Listen, can I read something? Is there any, any good books? So they recommended a few uh, Dhamma books that were around, and I kind of read them, and I thought, oh, yeah, that's all right. And then I, I asked them, where's the real stuff? And uh, and they said, oh, you know, well, yeah, there's the there's the Tripitaka. You can you can try reading that. So I got hold of the Majjhima Nikaya, and then that's <laughs> that was the end of that. So uh, that was like the second thing. And of course, when you start to read the suttas, then the suttas mm, give you some more context to put the meditation experience in. The suttas don't just teach meditation, they teach about many different aspects of life, yeah? Uh, and and uh, how to live and where, what to be doing and all kinds of things. So, you know, kind of reading this and then it, of course it became very apparent how difficult it was to live that life and, and so on as, uh, as a layman and not really knowing how to integrate that, how to bring that into my life. So, uh, I t and also very obvious how uh, you know much of 
you know, what is uh, contemporary Buddhism uh, doesn't have a lot to do with uh, the actual teachings that the Buddha himself was teaching. So, uh, like many people do, I sort of, you know, moved around for a while and tried out a few different kinds of things uh, and ended up at uh, Wat Nanacha in northeastern Thailand uh, with the monastery of Ajahn Chah. Now, Ajahn Chah himself uh, was born not far from that in a little village near Ubon Ratchatani. Uh, Ubon Ratchatani these days is quite a large regional city. It's one of the two or three largest regional cities in the northeast of Thailand. Um, I guess there's maybe a million or two people there or something like that. Of course, when Ajahn Chah was born, it was much smaller. <coughs> and uh, the region of northeast Thailand is the poorest area of Thailand. And it's uh, very uh, um, uh, renowned for having uh, very bad soil uh, and very bad uh, weather, very poor rainfall, hot in the hot season, cold in the cold season. And they say that's why so many good monks come from there. So, uh, Ajahn Chah was born there. He originally, um, you know, had probably seemed to have some kind of connection when he was a kid. He used to, he used to uh, play being a monk. He used to get a towel, wrap, himself, wrap a towel around him, and uh, he'd get all the other kids to come and offer him food. <laughs> So uh, you know, maybe some kind of past life connection there or something. And, uh, or maybe he just liked to eat, I don't know. And then when he was still quite a young man, uh, he decided to go forth, as many, many uh, men do in Thailand. Of course, the, the opportunities for going forth among women uh, are limited or non-existent. Um, so he decided to go forth originally was just staying in the little village monastery in the, in the place where he, the village where he was living and uh, like 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 many monas many monks in 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 you know thousands of monasteries throughout Thailand they don't really there's not really much teaching or much idea of what they should be doing as monks and and uh, many people are surprised to know that you, there's no kind of uh, training or anything like that before you become a monk you just sort of go and do a ceremony and then you're a monk and then you're always left in the monastery and if you're lucky enough to be in somewhere where there's a teacher, then you can get some teaching and training. And if you're not, as probably the majority are not that lucky, then uh, you're pretty much left up to your own devices. And that's about it. There's a, there's a, there's a, a kind of a, a, an official encouragement to do some courses of study and so on. Uh, and you know, a reasonable amount of monks will do that, so they'll have some, some knowledge of, of Buddhism. Uh, and when he was staying there for the first two or three years in this little village monastery, Ajahn Chah, um, you know, was interested in a number of different things. He was a bit of a herbal medicine, a herbal doctor, uh, would do that kind of thing. And then he would uh, gradually, he would study a bit of the, the texts that were around, that were available to him, um, which probably would have been mainly things like the Jataka stories, the uh, Dhammapada commentary stories, these kinds of things. You hear in his Dhamma talks, he'll refer to these kinds of stories quite frequently. And he started to learn Pali. So, um, you know, he's starting to get a grounding in Pali grammar. Um, and then after a few years of this, he was looking at nominatives and accusatives and instrumentals and then he's thinking this surely this isn't the essence of the Dhamma and uh, <laughs> there's got to be something more to it than this so he decided to go on what they call Tudong in Thailand and uh, Tudong is a Thai sort of form of the Pali word Dutanga and Dutanga means an ascetic practice so there's usually like a, a group of ascetic practices traditionally 13 uh, which uh, monastics can elect to, to do. And so they, they're things like, say, eating at one sitting in a day or um, <clears throat> dwelling at the root of a tree, uh, things like that. But in Thailand, the word, the word tudong doesn't really mean that in Thailand. The word tudong means uh, kind of wandering around 
uh, staying in the forest. That's what they do and wandering from monastery to monastery and staying in the forest. Actually, the, the proper Pali word for that is charikawa, they use in, in uh, Sri Lankan. So he was uh, decided to go wandering on Tudong. Didn't really know much about what he was doing. Walking off down the road after a few miles, he realized that his, his bags were incredibly heavy. So he started chucking things out of his bag. The first thing to go with his, was his mortar and pestle. So he had, you know, the heavy stone grinding water and pestle he had for his herbal medicines. That was the first one to go. And uh, so he's kind of learning some lessons about letting go very early. And spent many years traveling around, staying in different monasteries, practicing in different places, studying with different teachers. Now, Ajahn Chah never had one particular teacher who was his, his kind of main teacher. There was a number of teachers he, he stayed with. Upul Ginnari was one, uh, Ajahn Man was another. And from each of these teachers, he would learn some kind of uh, lesson uh, and some of the uh, kind of random events. I don't, I don't have Ajahn Chah's biography in my mind in, in such a lot of detail that I can uh, tell it to you in a lot of detail. Uh, one of the uh, English monks, Ajahn Jayasaro, uh, has been or was at, some, at one stage engaged in writing a very, very excellent biography of Ajahn Chah, but unfortunately he seems to have um, relinquished that particular project in recent years, so I'm not sure that it'll ever get completed. Uh, <clears throat> but just a few random episodes. Um, one one occasion when he was staying in a monastery, and Ajahn Chah had a lot of um, sort of kind of comical adventures with his his requisites. And uh, you know, he he for example, if you go to the, there's a museum in his monastery, and they have his bowl there, and his bo he's got this huge bowl like this. I don't know how big it is. It's huge. He was called the the big bowl monk for a while, and he used to carry this around, and he he. He would try to. He didn't. Didn't. Sometimes he, he he didn't have robe material, so he would sort of use the the, the foot wiping cloth or something like that and wash it and, and sew it up to make his robes. And on this particular occasion, he was hand sewing one of his robes, and he was sitting outside of the uh, kuti sewing. And as he sat there, very intent on his work, the sun moved, and he became exposed. He was sewing in the full sun. Yeah? And so sitting there sweating away and sort of, you know, obviously kind of very, very overheated and sewing. And the teacher, I think that time was Lumpul Kinnery, uh, came and saw him doing that and said, Char, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm sewing this robe. He said, what are you sewing a robe for? So? He said, oh, I want to get it finished so I can go off and meditate. And Lumpul Kinnery said, Char, he said, your, your mind is agitated right here and now. And why you want to go off and meditate so you can make your mind peaceful? And so that, that, that teaching really struck him at that point. Yeah? So this is, this is how the, the Thai forest tradition teaches, to find that the right thing to say at the right time. And so that was one of the things that really struck him uh, about uh, the Dhamma, yeah? to, to practice in the here and now, that it's not something that we go over there, we wait till the right time to be able to practice. Wherever we are, whatever we do, whatever activity we're pursuing, that's the right time to be peaceful. That's the right time to be mindful. So this was another of the uh, uh, um, one of the experiences Ajahn Chah had. Another example, uh, he was having uh, a conversation with a monk at one monastery about the Vinaya. And this is something that as Ajahn Chah's career went on, he became more and more interested in the Vinaya. He studied it in depth and became um, almost obsessed with, with uh, working out what's the right way of practicing the Vinaya, of course, the, the code of monastic conduct for, for bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. And he really wanted to figure out how to, to practice that in its, in its fullness and in all its details. And yet, of course, there are many uncertain points. There are many gray areas and so on. And so he, like many of, the, many of us, is sort of struggling to, to, to figure out how to apply this. Uh, and one monastery he went to, there was another monk there, learned in Vinaya, and he would have long discussions with him in the afternoon about the Vinaya. One day they finished this discussion, and Ajahn Chah, in the evening, went to the top of a mountain, and they were staying in the, in the uh, uh, mountainous area, and he climbed to the top of the mountain to do walking meditation in the evening. And as he was walking there, it became quite late, and then he heard this crashing through the jungle. 
and this sort of crashing noise coming up the slope of the mountain. He thought, oh, it must be a bear or something like that is coming, maybe a tiger or something. He didn't know what it was. He was starting to get afraid. And then he realized that, that it was a monk. And it, was, and it came up, and it was the same monk he'd been discussing with that afternoon. He said, oh, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I, I just realized I just made a mistake when I explained a point of vineyard to you this afternoon. And I just wanted to correct, you know, we said this is such and such, and actually it should be the other way. And he said, oh, thank you for that. But he said, you, you could have told me tomorrow, yeah? <laughs> he said, no, no, no. He said, you might have died tonight, or I might have died tonight, and then you, 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 we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had the right understanding. So I had to tell you right now. <laughs> so there was another event that really kind of struck home for Ajahn Chah, yeah? The urgency of practice, yeah? The importance of... Uh, practicing right now, you never know what tomorrow is going to bring. So again, these are the kinds of ways that uh, lessons are brought home in the forest tradition. Yeah? Uh, that, that, that sense of, of, of reality about things. Uh, so I'm not, not sure how many uh, uh, Ajahn Chah stories to... Um, to relate, of course, many stories. Um, but anyway, after after the after he had um, been wandering for many years, he was invited to go back and set up uh, a monastery, a forest monastery near his home village. So it was actually just down the road from where he was born that he set up what the monastery they know today is Wat Bapong, is the the head monastery of the Ajahn Chah tradition. So he went back there and set, set the monastery up. Now it seems that, uh, of course, Ajahn Chah is very widely regarded as being an arahant, as being fully enlightened. And, um, but it seems that when he set up Wat Bapong that he had not yet finished his, his practice. Uh, the story I heard at Wat Nanachat was that there's a particular picture on the wall there of him uh, as quite a young monk at Wat Bapong after he just arrived there for a year or two. And uh, when Ajahn Chah sort of saw that picture, he said, oh, I still, when, that, when that photo was taken, I still, still had delusion then. So uh, he still continued his practice after he arrived there. And he, 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 one of the things that he learned in his time traveling around Thailand uh, was that he, 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 he noticed that uh, a lot of the traditions, that there was a pattern where you would tend to have a, a great teacher who would emerge, uh, it would be very inspiring, have great practice, and would gather many disciples and so on around them. And then when the teacher passed away, everything would fall apart. Yeah? The, the disciples became too dependent on the teacher. And so there's a tradition, and certainly within the Thai forest tradition, there's a tendency to make it a very, it's a very strong, what they call Acharya Vada, it's like a teacher's uh, doctrine, like a teacher, the school of the teachers. And so that's very much what you hear if you go around those monasteries, that it, there's, it's, it's, it is so because the Ajahn says it's so. Yeah? Now, this is, of course, a doctrine that I'm trying to encourage people at Santi Monastery to adopt, but I haven't had much success so far. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so um, if, you, if you set up a, a, a monastery like that... Um, it has its pros and cons. I mean, if, you, if, the, if the teacher is genuinely spiritually attained and spiritually advanced, then um, the, a very devotional attitude can bring people along very easily. They can kind of draw people along and they, people give themselves to that practice and then they can, they can advance quite quickly. Uh, but it's also very fragile. It's, all, uh, it's very open to abuse. Uh, and you tend to attract people who need that, right? So you tend to attract the kinds of people who need a guru to fix on and an ajahn to follow. And so when the ajahn dies or becomes very old or something like that, uh, usually they, they make a stupa for the teacher, yeah? uh, cremate, have a cremation, make the, get the relics, put them in a stupa, build the stupa, and then it becomes a tourist destination and all the practicing monks disappear and go somewhere else. That's the, the life cycle of a forest monastery in Thailand, and usually just one generation. Okay? So the life cycle of the forest monastery, you should know, is, is you have a, f a bit of patch of forest, a couple of monks wandering around on Tudong, they arrive there, they put up a mosquito net, 
They stay there for a while. The lay people invite them to set up for the rains. They build a kuti, a couple of huts for the rains retreat. They stay on there. Gradually as they stay, they, their practice deepens. More people come. They define the monastery by putting a wall around it, build a sala, a hall, build more permanent huts and so on. The teacher uh, becomes well known. People start to flock in. More people come. Then when the teacher dies, they build a stupa and then only the tourists come and all the practice monks go somewhere else. And that's usually the, the life cycle of, of most of the forest monasteries in Thailand. <clears throat> Just one, one generation. <coughs> So Ajahn Chah saw that, and he wanted to try to shift that um, pattern. And essentially, the, 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 the manner in which he did that was to, uh, in basically in the same way that the Buddha did it. And the Buddha, after he became enlightened, uh, g gradually started to devolve responsibility onto the Sangha. And of course, the great, the most important aspect of that is, is allowing the Sangha to perform ordinations. And so the Buddha, you know, originally the Buddha would, would perform his own ordinations. You know, you come and be my disciple and would ordain them. Later on he said to the monks, no, 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 you go off and you do your own ordinations. So that's very, very important. That means that the, that, that's, that, that critical juncture in building the sasana had been handed over to the, the, uh, the followers. And uh, so this Ajahn Chah followed a similar kind of uh, principle uh, where, whereas, say, uh, to compare a different character, Ajahn Mahabua would tend to, uh, as one of the other great forest masters, he would tend to tell people, you know, you stay with me. And a lot of his monks have just been with him for 30 years or 40 years or something like that, and they don't go anywhere. Even the Western monks often have been there for, with him for, for that amount of time, you know, 20 years, 30 years, and the only time they leave is to go and, and do their visa in Bangkok yeah, and then come back again. Otherwise, they just stay in the same monastery. Whereas Ajahn Chah was always sending people away and uh, uh, giving them responsibility, devolving responsibility. Whereas other teachers would say, don't, don't teach Dhamma until you're enlightened. Right? Wait until you're an Arahant before you teach the Dhamma. Yeah? We don't, want any, you know, don't, don't, don't think, oh, yeah, I'm a stream mentor already. Yeah? It's okay to be giving Dhamma talks. Okay? <laughs> wait until you get fully enlightened and then give you Dhamma talks. Right? Uh, whereas Ajahn Chah would, would tell even junior monks just to, to, to get up there and give a talk. Yeah? And so he was uh, uh, always shifting uh, these things and would always do it in a way that would um, <coughs> subvert people's expectations. And of course, many stories of the, 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 the ways that he would torture his monks. And, and of course... It always has to be put into a context because Ajahn Chah had this. People always say he had this incredible metta, and he would just draw people towards him, and people would just 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 flock around him constantly because of the incredible power of his metta. But he would never allow that to to sort of turn into too much of a guru cult. Uh, so, just a few examples of how he would do this. Uh, um, uh, Say for one time he invited, when, when Ajahn Sumedho was a, a, a junior monk, he asked him to give a, uh, a Dhamma talk, get up on the Dhamma seat and start teaching Dhamma. So Ajahn Sumedho was very pleased with this and he thought he can get a chance to show off how much he knows about Dhamma and how, much he, he, um, how good his Thai has become and all of these kinds of things. So he get up and te teach his Dhamma for an hour and then he says, okay, now that's enough, I'll finish my talk. And Ajahn Chah says, no, no, keep going, keep going. So he, so he says, oh, all right, okay. So he thinks there's something else to say and then talks for another half an hour or something. He gets ready to finish. Ajahn Chah says, keep going, keep going. Yeah? <laughs> and he kept him going until he was just sitting there like, feeling completely stupid and, and nothing to say. Yeah? Uh, another, another occasion when one of the other Western monks was, uh, had learnt the Padimoka. It's like the, the, the 227 rules for the bhikkhus. And we recite them in Pali every fortnight, right? So you, this, is, this is like a bit of a, speaking of spiritual materialism, right? This is a bit of a kind of spiritual materialist kind of gung-ho thing that the monks can learn, is to even learn the Padimokha and then recite it really nicely and especially really fast, okay? So if you can do it really fast, so sometimes the monks will be sitting there with stopwatches when you're going, uh, <laughs> and he says, come on. Okay, oh, 37 minutes, great. Yeah. 
And uh, so it's a bit of a kind of game that we have. And so one Western monks got up and recited it and did a very, very nice job. And uh, Ajahn Chah congratulated him. He said, oh, that was a, that was a nice recital. And uh, normally they would go uh, on a roster. Yeah? And uh, he was so pleased with himself that he decided to swap with the monk who was supposed to be rostered the next fortnight. Yeah? And so he could do, his, do it again. So he got up and to do it again. And, and he, he, this time Ajahn Chah uh, was sitting behind him and uh, while he was trying to recite, Ajahn Chah kept poking him with his walking stick, yeah? <laughs> making him forget all his lines. Yeah? <laughs> making him forget his, his, his lines, uh, the, the, the chant. <clears throat> so, uh, so many, many stories of, of these kinds of things that, that uh, Ajahn Chah would do. Another one, you know, when, when he said that when, when, people would, when people would come after the rains retreat, people would, the monks would come and they'd say, oh, you know, what they wanted to do and they'd discuss about where they wanted to go or what they wanted to do afterwards. And so they said that typically what would happen is one of the monks would come and say, uh, uh, Ajahn, I'm, I'm very, uh, uh, you know, I, I feel that I've been here long enough. I'd like to go on Tudong. I'd like to sort of wander around and find a nice place in seclusion to do some meditation. And Ajahn Chah would say, what do you want to do, go wandering around the place like a tourist for? You should stay here with me. Yeah? You need to get some, uh, put down some roots and just concentrate on your practice here. So the monk would go, oh, okay, okay, Ajahn. So he'd say, then the next monk would come along and say, oh, Ajahn, I'm, I'm feeling quite content staying here with you and I'd, I'd like to just stay on here if that's okay. And he'd say, oh, you're getting lazy and complacent. You need to go out on Tudong. Yeah? <laughs> So he'd kind of teach like this. Now, one of the things that we found among the Western monks, of course, is that uh, you can't do that kind of thing unless you're Ajahn Chah. Yeah? And so a lot of the, when the Western Ajahns started to teach, you know, they, they, they tried to kind of imitate these, these styles that Ajahn Chah had. And of course, it doesn't work. Yeah? It worked because it was Ajahn Chah yeah? and because people had such faith in him and because he was who he was. And... Uh, trying to just copy these kinds of techniques and things. It just doesn't work. Yeah? You just end up breeding resentment and so on. So after a certain point of time, uh, Ajahn Chah started to attract Western disciples. And Ajahn Sumedho, of course, being the first and, and best known. Um, and they would trickle in from time to time and a certain amount of them would stay on and ordain. Uh, after a while, there were certain Westerners who were hanging around. Jack Cornfield was one of them in Bangkok and a few others who would send people up to Ajahn Chah and they would say, oh, yeah, if you, know, if you want to practice, go and see Ajahn Chah. And so they gathered a kind of community of Western disciples and, and the senior ones of them, like Ajahn Sumedho, uh, spoke quite good Thai, so they were able to do some translating and teaching. And that was very rare yeah? in those days in Thailand. Even today in Thailand, it's still difficult to find somewhere where you actually get some teaching in English. Uh, so it sort of gradually started to build. And of course, you had a sort of distinctive flavor to the Western community. Uh, and so, so as that grew, uh, Ajahn Chah began to say, say to the, the monks, you know, you, know you, should, you should set up your own place. And so originally, actually, he sent them to another monastery. I can't remember, I think maybe, what, Tom Sang Pad or something. And it didn't actually work out. The, the, the monks had some disagreements or disputes or something. I'm not quite sure what happened. But in any case, the first attempt didn't work out. Then they were invited to go to this other place called Wat Banana Chart, which is quite close to Wat Bapong. And uh, the, the monks used to go there to... Um, get bamboo for firing their bowls because we have our monks our arms bowl and these days in Thailand the arms bowls made of stainless steel and usually we'll fire them uh, to, to, to make them to blacken them make them grey and uh, uh, they would typically use bamboo for that and this, this particular village had a good source of bamboo and they, so they got to know the villagers like that and then the villagers asked them to come and set up a forest monastery there actually it was in the charnel ground still is the charnel ground. So the, the place where the, mon where the forest was is where they would burn the corpses. And uh, 
the um, of course that's why the villagers didn't like to go there because it's full of ghosts and it actually is full of ghosts there's, there's so many ghost stories from what Nana chart that it's it's not funny well depending on what your perspective of it sometimes it's funny but um, so the monks they didn't really want to do that actually the monks the, the they wanted to stay with Ajahn Chah yeah, they, and they didn't really want to have the responsibility they didn't want to do the work of building a monastery they didn't know how to do it you know it's an incredible burden and they didn't have any precedents yeah and even to this day if we think about it there's actually I don't know anywhere else in the world where uh, foreign monks have actually set up a, a monastery in you know in a traditional Buddhist country there's, there are one or two places in in Sri Lanka um, like the the island hermitage um, but they which which you know lasted for a while doing that but it's still it's very very rare uh, to find that even today so but that's what they did they went there and started to build a monastery and so on um, and you know it wasn't easy and and you know the monks aren't necessarily completely holy and completely pure people all that time all, all the time it may come as a bit of a shock to you but we don't actually have the the there's no kind of operation we have when we're, we're ordained that sort of takes all the the defilements out of us when we ordain actually and uh, so we still carry our own our old conditioning and so on along with us and uh, so that makes it difficult and there was one occasion when um, one of the senior monks was uh, still staying with Ajahn Chah at Wat Bapong and, and one of the monks said to him oh you should go over to where, where, stay with the other western monks he said oh, I'm not going to go over there to stay with that that bunch of and the other monk said say it he said I'm not going to go and stay with that bunch of he said say it with that bunch of with, with, that, bun with that bunch of hippies <laughs> So of course this was the uh, 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 early 70s, mid 70s, and uh, the early monks were all uh, a lot of them ex hippies or still still practicing hippies, or um, uh, um, ex servicemen. A lot of them were were U.S. servicemen during the Vietnam War. Uban Ratchatani was a B-52 base, and so that was uh, where they first started to get introduced to. Uh, Western delights like ice cream and things like that was because of the American servicemen staying in the local town. The first time that they had ice cream at Wat Ba Pong, uh, you know, they, they sort of come and it's like a big deal, right? Then you think this is a big deal. You've got sticky rice, you've got rotten fish sauce, you've got some dried bits of fish, you've got some bitter vegetables plucked from the from the from the from the forest, and a banana. And you've had the same thing basically every day for the whole of your life, and then somebody brings some ice cream, right? So all the monks are sitting there, they're getting very, very excited, okay? And uh, <coughs> of course, in Wapapong tradition, you eat everything out of one bowl, right? So none of this namby pamby having little extra bowls to put your ice cream in, right? <laughs> so. The ice cream gets handed down and each of the monks takes some in turn. You put a spoonful of ice cream in the bowl. You try to take the biggest spoonful you can without looking like you're taking the biggest spoonful that you can in the bowl. And then you normally you give the blessing and then eat the, eat the food. But that day, for some strange reason, Arjun Chah had all this business to do with the lay people before they started eating the meal. And he kept on bringing this thing up. Oh, I was meaning to mention to you about the fence at the back we were going to fix up. Now I noticed the other day that that, that that the wire at the top of the fence was broken again. Did you get round to finding? Oh, yeah, okay. And the monks were sitting there, <laughs> <laughs> and this went on for quite some time. Yeah. Eventually, Ajahn Chah gives the blessing, and the monks, oh, and they open up the bowl lid, and the, the, the ice cream just disappeared. <laughs> it's all gone. It's all all been absorbed into the sticky rice. So now you're having vanilla flavored rotten fish sauce sticky rice. <laughs> so uh, these are the uh, the teaching methods which Ajahn Chah used, which I for one don't dare to do. So among the monks eventually, yes, so the monks went over to what Nanachat and set up there and 
you know, did did very well. So it managed to establish a monastery, remembering, you know, the, all these you know, different people from different backgrounds, different countries. See, originally most of them were uh, American, actually. They, they, the, the original name, they were going to call it What American was going to be the original name of the monastery. Thank goodness they didn't go ahead with that one. <coughs> so... What Nanachat, of course, means the International Forest Monastery. There was a lot of resistance from the other village monasteries in the area. Uh, they, they viciously opposed uh, the establishment of Wat Nanachat, um, launched a campaign with the villagers to stop them and so on, because they were not Thai, uh, because they were introducing new things, um, because the practice of the forest monks, they keep vinaya and do meditation and teach dhamma and things like that. And that's not always what's going on in some of the other monasteries. So it's a bit of a threat. Yeah. Uh, even when I, was, when I was there, which was many years later, 20, 20 years later, uh, they still had a sign outside of one of the village temples. That just, it just said, we love Thai customs. Yeah? So if you didn't know anything about it, you wouldn't realize why that was there. But actually, that's why that sign was there. It's sort of the last relic of that, uh, that kind of fight. So uh, they came there. They gradually built uh, their sala and the um, different uh, kutis and things like that. Ajahn Sumedho, of course, was invited by the English Sangha Trust to go and set up a monastery in England, uh, which he did with a number of the other senior monks, and they handed the leadership of, of what Nanachat over to a, a series of abbots uh, and the, the kind of the longest the abbot who was there for the longest period was a monk called Ajahn Pasano and uh, he was my teacher he was still there when I arrived so when I got there in 93 beginning of 93 uh, that was about his 20th wasa about his 20th reigns I think either that one or the one before was his 20th reigns and he'd been there. He'd been the abbot there, I think, since he had seven wasa about that, seven reigns as a monk. So he'd been there about thirteen years or something as the abbot. Uh, and uh, so he that had obviously developed its own style and so on by then. Now, uh, 